All right, welcome to the Inverse Problems Lecture and today we will talk about how to choose the regularization parameter. Um, mainly in Tihon of regularization but also in sparsity promoting like total variation and and for example the wavelet things we have been looking at. Okay, so first of all let's look at the L-curve method. And I think I'll start with just showing you a computation from one of the courses. Uh, oh, MATLAB is not responding. Hmm. The beach ball of death. Well, let's reopen. Okay. Okay, so L-curve method. The L-curve method is based on computing reconstructions with many parameters. So here is a one-dimensional deconvolution problem and I'm computing it first with small values of alpha and then going bigger and bigger values. And you see the reconstruction how it goes from noisy to nice regularized and then when alpha becomes bigger and bigger, well, the reconstruction goes toward the zero function, as we have seen before. Uh, here is the reconstruction suggested by the L-curve method. Oh, where did it come from? Uh, let's see. The point is that in the L-curve there is a curve like this that's supposed to look like the letter L. The idea would be that there is a corner for alpha, or kind of a corner in the curve, and we should pick out the, the alpha uh, that indicated by this corner point. Okay, so what is this curve and what's going on? Let's uh, take a look at... Uh, the book and see. So we have uh, methods for choosing the regularization parameter. Uh, so 5.4.2, the L-curve method. Let's go there. Um, so the L-curve method, what is the idea? So we choose uh, a collection of regularization parameters from very small to very large, as we saw uh, the computations just now. And then the curve I showed. What is the curve? Well, this is the curve. Um, the x-coordinate in the curve is this one. So we take the reconstruction for a certain alpha called T alpha M. So this is the reconstruction. We apply our measurement model matrix A to it and we subtract the actual measurement. So we compute the data discrepancy for that reconstruction. We compute uh, the L2 norm of the data discrepancy and we take a logarithm. This is the x-coordinate for the curve. And, of course, it is measuring how well our reconstruction is fitting to data. Then this part applies our regularization matrix L to uh, the reconstruction. So in this case, we have Tihonov, generalized Tihonov regularization uh, with the matrix L appearing in the penalty term. So we apply the same matrix L that we use in the regularization. We apply it here to the reconstruction, take the L2 norm of the result and logarithm. This will be the y-coordinate. So for each value of alpha we use, we get a point 
in the plane. And actually, we, we think of getting a curve, kind of thinking that we compute this for all alpha in an interval of the real line. So that interval will be get mapped to R2, and we see a curve. And the idea behind the L-curve method is that uh, the, the Z-curve should look like the letter L. Sometimes it is the case, uh, sometimes it may be hard to see any letter L shape in the result. And uh, I think somehow the strength of the L-curve method is that it's quite simple. Uh, then I think there are kind of two weaknesses of the method. One of them is that uh, you need to compute quite many reconstructions to build this curve. And on the other hand, it just doesn't always work. Sometimes we get curves that really don't look like an L, and then what can you do? Uh, yeah, question? Yeah, I just wondered about the uh, logarithm step. That's mainly because of the scaling, or is it? Or does it uh, like, uh, does it affect the normal form? Is it just because of the logarithm? Good question. Um, hmm. I think there is, I don't think there is some deep significance in this logarithm. I might be wrong, but somehow I suspect that it's just, just to keep the whole curve in a more manageable domain of R2 to make it easier to see this, this L shape. Yeah, I think it squeezes it more to a manageable form. I think that's the idea, but... I'm not completely sure about that. Of course. Uh, so is the yeah. point is sort of choose the uh, alpha for which we get the sort of smallest norm of, on that curve? That's one way to think about it. I think many methods of automatically choosing the corner point, I think, are based on something like that. Some of them are based on curvature, of finding the biggest curvature. So you're, you're yeah. minimizing both the discrepancy and the, and, and the regularization. Yeah somehow, yeah, somehow the idea is to find the balance between satisfying the regularization part and satisfying the data discrepancy. And this is somehow one way to do it, and yeah, I think there, there, there are many studies about, uh, theoretical studies as well about the L-curve method. I'm not really an expert on this, but I somehow have an, uh, I think it's rather difficult to really analyze theoretically perfectly what is going on in, in different situations with the L-curve method. I'm sorry if I'm offending any researchers of the L-curve method. Sorry, that's not my point, but anyway. Uh, sorry, uh, question yeah. about, is this method used for assessing the result by itself in any time? Yes. Uh, do we, can we say that there is no resolution of those? For alpha values? Or? Uh, no resolution of the, of the real image, uh, the Right, to compute first uh, the reconstruction on a coarser scale yeah. and kind of, yeah, sure, that would be a, yeah. Hmm. Uh, the alpha being the same or not same over different re uh, resolutions is, I think that's kind of a deep question that has, it has been studied a little bit, but I think mostly only recently. So it's, um, I think it would be a great topic for further research, but uh, I'm not sure if it's really well known what happens. There is one method I will address a bit later for total variation based on different resolutions, but that's, that's very new research actually, and still partly open what's going on there. But okay, so we, we wanted to see uh, the plot without Okay, so let's do, let's do, for fun. So we can use the scale, Yeah. So it's person change the form. Yeah, but it's, it's a nonlinear is anyway, kind of a nonlinear function, so the, the shape of the plot may change quite drastically. Maybe, of course, it nothing deep really happens with having 
because the logarithm is anyway a monotonically behaving function. But let's see, um, where is my plot command here? Uh, let's just, let's do it in a very simple way and just plot, just remove these logs and see what happens. And we get to see the beautiful movie again. I think here uh, it's the classical Tihon of regularization with just identity as the uh, penalty matrix. That's the reconstruction and <clears throat> so this would be the L curve without the logarithm. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's better this way. Oh. Hmm. Oh, maybe it's better. Cool. Let's try what happens when we change the noise level, although maybe this is one of the <coughs> one of the old courses, maybe we have to, let's put some more, let's put 10% noise. So now our data is quite noisy, as you can see the blue dots there. Uh, and then I wonder if we can already just compute this one. Maybe we can. So now I think we shall need a larger parameter uh, to achieve regularization. And now this is wrong, this is still wrong because, uh, well, this is without the logarithm, this one, and this is with the logarithm. So now I think maybe we should be, maybe this is the L. Although here is also something like, but I think this is maybe the main L. You see the difficulty, I mean, it's not so clear what it is, but uh, let's choose this one. And in this case, we, uh, I didn't do this Like I say here, the choice of which is the L, <laughs> the corner of the L should be somehow automatic. Could you just calculate the error for each reconstruction and make these large holes to make it smooth? What do you mean by error? Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of contains, um, yeah. yeah. Run selection, how can I do run selection? Oh. Sorry? I did close the figure, yes. Let me just... Well, this is the one without logarithm. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, let's let's choose it with uh, let's choose it with this one, and see how it looks like. So I think. Oh, let's see. Maybe this has to be <coughs> bigger. Sorry, I'm confused. Let's see what happens if I put a bigger one. Very scientific. Oh, but it was correct. Haha. <laughs> -ha. Maybe it was very scientific. Okay, so. A bit too much. Let's come back uh, to 300, maybe. Uh, okay, so maybe maybe that could be maybe a bit more. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> 
And actually, let's plot it also in the other one. without the logarithm 1. Oh. oh, sorry, yes. Ah. Okay, so somehow if you don't use the logarithms, you end up with a different method, it seems. Okay. It, I mean, I really don't see any L corner in this image at that point. I don't know which one is better, but it's different. And then... Uh, the point is the same. The alpha is the same, yeah. yeah so alpha is the same. Like. Yeah, it's just how it looks. Well, that's... <laughs> That's how this method is a little bit uh, <laughs> not so precise, maybe. It's based on how this log plot looks. Yeah, yeah. 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 Maybe it's the maximal point of the second, minimal point of the second also, or something. Maybe some other minimal. Yes, there, there, and there are lots of studies like this yeah. based on curvature or yes, the second derivative, which in, in this case is related to the curvature. Yes. There are many methods like this, but really in some uh, inverse problems, some examples, <coughs> this curve just fails to really have a corner. And in that kind of case, it, it, it's hard to say what to do. However, if it works, it's nice because it's, it's rather simple. And anyway, well, among the reconstructions we saw, this is maybe quite acceptable or uh, among the best maybe anyway. I'm not sure. But that's the L-curve method. Any more questions about the L-curve method? Yes. Yeah, if we have the ground truth, then of course we can very nicely uh, compute the best. Yeah. But in uh, sorry? yeah no because now we have the 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 pleasure of having the original signal to compare with but but in the practical inverse problem that's we don't have it and that's the whole thing I mean what what is the best one I mean for example we could we could uh, for example see how this looks like if we just comment this, ah, not this one. So now if we take a look at this, now the question is, which one is best? Which one is, is, is the best reconstruction? That is the question we are facing in this Tihon of regularization case. What is the best one? I mean, who knows? This is, yeah, this is the difficulty in inverse problems. We don't know. Oh, but now we know. Ah, oh, this is best according to the L-curve method, at least. Yes, but not, we should use the logarithms, I guess. At least to, uh, to use the classical. Sorry, please repeat, repeat the question. Can one, one, yeah, of course, of course, one could uh, minimize somehow in both alpha and f. But I think then it's kind of unclear what is the meaning of the... I'm, I'm not sure if, if that gives a meaningful result. Maybe it's worth trying, but I, I, I think because... Because alpha is giving the trade-off between the data discrepancy 
and the, the a priori part in, in the penalty term. Uh, so somehow the actual value, the mi minimum value of that functional is maybe not so significant. More significant is the balance between how much are we uh, emphasizing the data discrepancy and how much the, the penalty term. It's kind of a trade-off between which one to favor more. And I'm afraid if you minimize the functional so that also the alpha is part of the minimization, I'm afraid the results may not be meaningful, but I'm not, it's worth trying. It's kind of seems like it's just going for the L curve, but it's one on the minimum of a penalty function, and it's just common. Maybe so, yes. Good thoughts, interesting thoughts. Uh, just on top of my head, I don't, I don't know what to say, but yeah. Maybe worth further study. I just write down here. Uh, Maybe I'll make a note here. Uh, okay, so that was the L-curve method. Sometimes it works, sometimes not. When it works, it's fine. Mm -hmm. May you have to give us credit. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yes, definitely. Good. And then uh, I would suggest moving on to the Morozov discrepancy principle, which uh, takes the idea mm, the starting point of Morozov's method is that we, we know how big the noise is so that we have some idea about the norm of the noise. Um, in practice, it's hard to say. Uh, it depends on the situation, if this is easy to know or not so easy. Somehow you could think, uh, for example, in a photographic uh, situation, you could imagine taking, for example, uh, 100 photos of the same scene, uh, if, if that's possible. So the scene is not moving, everything else is fixed, but then in each picture the noise is different. So then you could, uh, for example, make a histogram of the pixel values in, in a certain pixel. So then instead of having the same value all over again, you would have noise. So uh, you would have some kind of statistical deviation between a mean value. So you would, you would see a histogram. And then you could, uh, for example, compute the standard deviation in that histogram, so you would have an estimate of, of the noise amplitude. Of course, it may not be possible to take data of the same object so many times. Uh, you could, still in the photographic case, uh, if your picture contains an area that's roughly constant uh, in, in color, you could imagine taking then a standard deviation of the pixel values in that area of the photo and again compute the standard deviation. Well, uh, that kind of thing may be possible. Maybe you know your measurement device so well that you somehow can calibrate for the noise level in other ways. In many cases it's quite possible and plausible to do it, but sometimes it may be difficult. That's one criticism of the Morozov uh, approach that maybe sometimes we don't know the noise level. However, assuming that we have a good estimate for the size of noise, then the thinking in Morozov uh, goes that, okay, so if we keep the uh, data discrepancy, if we compute the data discrepancy for our reconstruction, 
So T alpha M is again our T of reconstruction. We apply our, our system matrix A to take virtual measurements and we subtract M. So this is somehow measuring how well does our reconstruction uh, reproduce the measurements. So we would think that that kind of any reconstruction that gives a smaller noise than delta is okay because we don't know anything under the noise level because that's somehow the accuracy of information we have. It, in this thinking, it, it's kind of meaningless to try to do something more accurate than, than the accuracy of our data. So that's the aim uh, for Morozov. We want to find an alpha so that, so that the data discrepancy actually matches the noise level exactly. So this is the principle in Morozov how to do this. And then uh, it can even be proved that there will be a unique alpha. Uh, well, in this case, that if the noise level is in some reasonable limits between uh, the size of the measurement and the norm of the uh, projected measurement, So there's a condition like this for the noise level, but if this is true, then we actually can pick out, uh, pick out alpha. And now, this year, uh, I didn't go through uh, a computation I usually do. So let's, let's go back a little bit in the book and, and see how the proof of theorem 511 looks like. Okay, where's, where's a K? K. Where's K? Where's K? Oh yes, yes. So yeah, it's it's the uh, yeah, size of the data yeah. vector. How many how many data points do we have in our measurement? Okay, so let's see uh, what is theorem five one one. So is this method quite useful for Bayesian problems? In Bayesian inversion, the whole thinking is different. There, uh, there we think that we know the statistical distribution of the noise. And there is no concept of a regularization parameter at all. Especially strict Bayesians have the opinion that uh, in the Bayesian inverse volume model, there is no need for any free parameters because uh, all is known from the measurement model and the noise structure and the prior distribution. Sometimes the reality is not so ideal, but anyway, there the thinking goes that, that uh, we put in the whole distribution of noise and use it in exploring the posterior distribution. So it's kind of a different, different philosophy there. So this is our computation that we didn't do this year. Uh, it, this theorem gives a way to write the Tihon of regularized solution in terms of the singular values. You remember we wrote the singular value uh, approach for the pseudo-inverse. We, uh, in the pseudo-inverse case, we had here, instead of the, um, or as a diagonal matrix here between V and U transpose, here we had something that we took the inverse of the singular values as long as they were positive until S R, I think we denoted it. So we took uh, 1 over S1, 1 over S2, and so on until 1 over S R. And then instead of dividing by 0, we just had zeros along the diagonal. That was the approach for the more Penrose pseudo inverse. Well, Tihon of regularization can be also written in the same form than the pseudo inverse the only difference being that this diagonal matrix here is chosen differently. The way to choose it is shown here. So actually what we do is we take uh, the singular value and we divide it by 
singular value square plus alpha. Alpha is the regularization parameter. And note that this one we can do for also for the zero singular value. So we can go all the way along the diagonal until the end of the diagonal. Because even if this is zero, so then we have zero here, we have then zero here, but then alpha is positive. So then there is no division by zero. There is just zero divided by a positive number, which is okay. So this is a way of computing the Tihonov regularization. Uh, it's nice from the theoretical point of view because we can, we can really analyze very clearly what's going on. In numerical practice, it's not so good because, again, then we would need the singular value decomposition of uh, our measurement matrix. And that's a really heavy computation for, for big problems. But for medium-sized problems, when, when we can compute the SVD, then this is, this is a way uh, to compute t of regularization. So let's quickly see what's going on here uh, in this computation. So the idea is to look at this, this Tihonov. Beach ball. Oh, beach ball, Tihonov beach ball, yes. So we, we put in the minimizer of the Tihonov functional inside the Tihonov functional and start computing. We put in uh, the SVD, we add here uh, the, the um, orthonormal uh, U matrix and we write the whole thing in, in a little bit differently. This, this norm, norm here is not changed uh, by, by um, an orthonormal matrix so we can we can actually, uh, well, it's a long computation and usually I spend at least one hour explaining this, so I don't know what to do. Mm. We'll not go through the whole thing here, so... What would be the main point to look at here? Maybe one of the main points is that we have uh, two different terms. We have one term going where j goes from 1 to r, where r is the last non-zero uh, singular value. And then we have another term here that goes from r plus 1 to n, so that's kind of the rest. Hmm. And extra terms. Okay, let's see if we can make sense of the models of according to this. Maybe this will make a nice uh, exam problem or something. Let's see. Where is our models of choosing the regularization parameter? Models of okay. So then. Um, there's a notation, u transpose m is called m prime. So u, u transpose is just an orthonormal uh, rotation or transformation of the uh, vector m. And let's see what happens here. So uh, as previously in the computation, we saw that we can divide, we, when, when computing such a term, uh, it, it divides up into something going from 1 to r, and then here, uh, here is the rest, which is much simpler. And then... Yeah, the singular value with index r plus 1 is already 0, unless if r goes all the way to the end of the diagonal, but yes. And analyzing this expression, we can see that this function is monotonically increasing. That's somehow the main point of this proof. So it's a function of one real variable alpha, and then 
Mm. Well, mm. going through really the whole thing would involve going through the computations. Well, let me just <laughs> note that after this proof, we know that there is a unique uh, alpha if the noise level satisfies uh, the, the appropriate uh, assumption. And then it all boils down to finding the, the zero point of a function f alpha defined like this. And in this definition, let's see what we have. There's a sum from 1 to r. There is alpha and there are the singular values appearing here. So if we have the singular value decomposition, this is quite straightforward to compute. M prime vector is just our data M multiplied by U tau. And then we have just the data components here and then we have uh, the noise level squared. And according to the proof, if the assumptions hold, this function has a unique zero. And that's the alpha we want. We want the alpha that uh, gives the unique zero of this f. So then, after this deeply flawed and insufficient explanation, let's see how this works. Uh, this is an even, even older computation I picked up from almost 10 years ago. Uh, at that point, at that point, my material was not as developed as it is today. So I think I think this uh, data is inverse crimey. No, it's avoided. Okay, good. So no problems with inverse crime. So here is uh, our data with some noise. So the red would be the perfect data. The black one here is the data with noise. Then uh, we have the function f. And I mark the zero line with, with a red horizontal line. So if we zoom in, we see that there is a unique zero for this function. And actually here I'm using some really uh, simple method Well, let's see through this in a minute. Let, let's first uh, compute with a different noise level. Let's put 20% noise, see what happens. Then uh, our function has a zero in, in a very different place here. There is a unique zero again, though, as the theorem says. And our data is much more noisy, as you can see. And our reconstruction looks a bit different, but well, with more noise, that's what happens. We have to take a bigger alpha and 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 we end up with a different okay, I think it's time for the break, so let's uh, look at the details of this computation after the break.